440, Chapter 54 of The Count of Monte Cristo. Book talk begins at 903. Welcome to Craftlit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 440, Double Plus Good. This episode of Craftlit is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledged their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. How are you? I hope you are well in this first episode of February 2017. My jaw is hitting the floor. How does time fly like this? I do not know. But fly it does, and the month of February we will be releasing podcasts every week, just like normal. The pre-holiday craziness is now done. The post-holiday craziness because of work travel is on pause. I don't travel again until March, and that is good for all of us, especially Alexandre Dumas. I have one crafty thing to share with you. We had a very nice chat this week on the Crafty Chat. We'll have Crafty Chats all month long as well, Tuesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern at the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash channel hyphen craftlet. And we also have, for those of you who are new, our call in line. So you can call and leave messages or comments or tell me what I got wrong. And that number is area code 206 350 you can call, you can leave a message, and I can play your audio on the show. I am also going to be on the Horse News Network. Now, by the time this audio comes to you, the show will have already aired. It's a live morning show. It is a podcast that is a live morning show. 9.30 Eastern on February 3rd is when I will be on this show. So you can go find the episode and I'll try and link to it from the show notes. I'm actually not sure if I can because their show notes work a little differently than mine do. So I'm not sure if it produces an actual link. But if you're not familiar with the Horse News Network, this is hosted by a guy named Glenn the Geek, who's been podcasting for a long while now. He's made a very successful empire and has many, many horse-related shows. And I know you're thinking, Heather, you don't ride horses, but I used to. I used to enthusiastically. And I have friends who still ride quite well. And so I've kind of been paying attention to Glenn the Geek in the background and all of the things that he's done. And the weirdest experience I've had in a while was in the Brussels airport. I was part of group five, the last group to board the plane. And I was standing behind this guy who's like 6'4". He's huge. And he's wearing a denim jacket that had stitching on the back that was odd. It showed, embroidered on the back, a guy on horseback shooting a gun at a target. That's odd to begin with because he wasn't like cowboy guy or stereotypical cowboy and Indian guy that you would kind of expect when I say on horseback shooting a gun at a target. No, this was new. And then it also had the name of the group. But that name of the group began with Steel Town. And I kept thinking, are there cowboys in Pittsburgh? Somehow those two words just don't seem to work together. Hey, I'm a Pittsburgh cowboy. That is not something normal to hear from anyone. But sure enough, he was from Pittsburgh. He has this whole, well, he has a whole business that has to do with horses because horses evidently get bored in their stalls the same way that the polar bears at the New York City Central Park Zoo got bored and needed toys. Horses need toys too in order to stay occupied. Otherwise, they start butting their heads against the wall. So this guy, who calls himself Uncle Jimmy, designed a really cool product. It is a thing you hang from the ceiling in a stall. It is compressed grain and healthy food stuffs. So it's this hanging ball of compressed food 
that the horses can headbutt and knock around and play with and nibble at. And it'll last for a couple of weeks, maybe maybe almost a month, depending on the horse. And so he calls these Uncle Jimmy's hanging balls. Of course he does, because that's what they are. So double entendres aside, he was at a trade show in the UK, which is why he was where he was when we were traveling back to the States. And so I said, you know, there's a kind of interesting way that you might want to look into advertising because there's this guy who has a podcast. And before I finished the word podcast, he said, you're talking about Glenn the Geek. And my jaw hit the floor again. Why, yes, I am. I'm one of the first people to have advertised on his show. I've been on his show a bunch. I was flabbergasted. Not only that, but it turns out that he was, in his previous life, a U.S. Air pilot. And he told me all the inside scoop on the Sully story. You may recall Sully. He is the amazing pilot who landed his plane in the Hudson River and saved everybody's life. Uncle Jimmy knew the flight attendants. He knew the the co-pilot rather well. It was just an incredible, incredible experience. So when I got back stateside, I emailed the guy who I had learned about Glenn the Geek from, Dave Jackson, who does School of Podcasting. He forwarded my email to Glenn, and Glenn and I had such a lovely time chatting on Facebook Messenger that he invited me on the show on Friday. So if you are interested in hearing how... <laughs> How a literature podcaster ties into the Horse News Network. Feel free to listen. <laughs> because life is weird. And Uncle Jimmy was so sweet. And I am very much looking forward to getting a chance to talk to him. Because Glenn has invited him on the show, keeping me secret to surprise Uncle Jimmy. And I'm very looking forward to talking to Glenn the Geek, too. He's a very interesting guy as well. So that's my weird news. My less weird news is crafty. And my crafty news for you is this. On this week's Crafty Chat, you will see if you go watch or you can look at a picture that's in the show notes. You'll see a a picture or you'll see me holding up a very specific oilcloth bag. If you're unfamiliar with oilcloth, this is the, the cloth that it feels like it's plastic coated on one side and it's obviously waterproof that way. And my mom gave me one for a Christmas present. It's kind of a a large-ish travel slash makeup bag. It's lovely, and it's very well made, and it's made by someone she knows in Tucson. The link to go and look at these is www.cerezastudio.com, and that is spelled C-E-R-E-Z-A, studio, S-T-U-D-I-O, all one word. I will link to this in the show notes as well. But Sherry Posternak is the one who owns and makes all of these bags. And they are beautiful. And this one, it's very colorful, big flowers on the outside. But it also has a little glitter pocket. So it's a see-through pocket that's been stitched on extra that's full of like glittery things and spangly things and sequiny things. And then there's a tiny little bottle of glitter that's hanging off of the zipper, which makes the zipper so easy to find. Oh my gosh, I love it. So if you are in the market for, I don't know, maybe a gift to give to someone or an oil cloth bag just for yourself, and you want to support an independent artist, no affiliation, yada, yada, and she's not a sponsor, I just thought it would be nice to share my mom's friend and the gorgeous craftiness that she puts out into the world. Yay. So that's that. And now let's talk about the Count of Monte Cristo. Chapter 54. Today's chapter isn't a big, fascinating chapter the way that we've had chapters recently, but it is an important one. It's setting the groundwork for several huge things that will happen down the line, not too far ahead from us. So, There's some characterization to pay attention to and characters to pay attention to. There are also some very witty things that Dumas puts into the mouth of people and has them name drop. One, he asks a character if he is making a sketch after Poussin, which is, are you making a sketch in the style of Poussin, who was a major painter of classical Baroque art? 
He lived from 1594 to 1665, and he, he worked mostly in Rome, although he was French, and he was eventually called back to France by Cardinal Richelieu to get him to come back and work as the king's main paint dude. I believe that was the official title. But one of the things that's interesting about him is even though he is a Baroque painter and Baroque is, uh, if you if you think about Baroque music, there are lots of layers, there are lots of things happening all the time. If you think about Baroque ceiling fiddly things, there's lots of fiddly bits that are going on if you look at Baroque architecture and, and finials and things like that. That's interesting because even though he was a classical French Baroque artist, one of the things that they say about him is that he favored line over color. So his fiddly bits are all in the complexity of the line. And I don't just mean like outlines of the people or outlines of the architecture. I mean the directions that people are leaning and facing. There's a lot of movement going on in his art. If you saw the Da Vinci Code or read it, and I know it's kind of spurious to go talking about the Da Vinci Code, but even even so, it's popular fiction that gets at the same point. One of the conversations is about the lines that are created by the characters in The Last Supper. Who is leaning in which direction? Who is facing in which direction? What is higher? What is lower? What is stationary? What is in motion? All of these kinds of lines draw your eyes in specific directions. And that appears to be part of what made Poussin so interesting. It also makes perfect sense that if somebody was sketching, especially if they are sketching something that looks like nothing more than lines, you might bring up Poussin. When you see which character is being questioned about this, it makes even more sense that he would have nothing but lines on his page. So we'll revisit that on the flip side. You'll hear another reference, which we've had several so far, a uh, reference to Manfred. This was the work by Lord Byron, big epic poem. It's got the supernatural stuff. It's gothic. It was written not too long after Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. It's also got the Byronic hero, sure, but he's also got some guilty secret. I mean, there are lots of Byronic heroes to choose from. The fact that we go back over and over again to Manfred clearly has something to do with the guilty secret side of Manfred's character. Now, in, in Manfred, it appears to be something about his relationship with a woman and that that's the guilty secret because that was Byron's guilty secret, too. But that doesn't seem to fit us quite so much in The Count of Monte Cristo. Certainly there's a woman involved, but guilty secret? Mm. I don't know. There are other secrets that are far more guilty than somebody having been in love with someone else. So that's Manfred. And there is a joke. And it's actually, it's an old joke. It's a, it's a long time ago the joke was made. It's about a guy, a Roman, Roman guy named Lucullus. L-U-C-U-L-L-U-S. He was a politician. He died in, I don't know, 57, 56 BC, something like that. Oh, he was a big deal. He did a whole bunch of stuff. That doesn't matter. What matters is that he really, really loved eating. <laughs> and I know that was not what you were expecting to hear. He was hugely famous about throwing banquets. And in fact, you may have heard the word Lucullan, meaning big, huge gourmet blowout. And there are several stories surrounding his gastronomic pursuits, but the one that is referred to in the story, and this is not a spoiler of any sort, is he had a great chef. He had a great cook who he employed, and he always had these banquets. And one night he decided that he was just not into it that night, and so he was going to eat by himself. And as a consequence, the cook, his chef, thought, oh, thank God, I don't have to cook another ginormous banquet. So it would be like, <laughs> it would be like having made your own pate the night before and then hearing that you didn't have to be on display quite so much. He made tomato soup and grilled cheese. You know, nothing, nothing special. Just open the can, heat it up, 
Maybe add a little milk to the tomato soup if you're feeling really fancy. And, and that was it. Lucullus's response to this was along the lines of, don't you know that the most important meal is when Lucullus dines with Lucullus? <laughs> the nights when I'm alone, I'm really paying attention because there's nobody else here to bug me. So don't shirk the food responsibility that's on your shoulders. And that is the entire joke. And it's a joke that gets referenced in the weirdest places, like the Count of Monte Cristo. Ha! Huh, there you are. And here we are, ready for our chapter, chapter 54 of The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 54 A Flurry in Stocks. Some days after this meeting, Albert de Morcerf visited the Count of Monte Cristo at his house in the Champs Elysees, which had already assumed that palace like appearance which the Count's princely fortune enabled him to give even to his most temporary residences. He came to renew the thanks of Madame Danglars, which had been already conveyed to the Count through the medium of a letter signed Baron Danglars, née Hermine de Servieux. Albert was accompanied by Lucien de Bray who, joining in his friend's conversation, added some passing compliments, the source of which the Count's talent for finesse easily enabled him to guess. He was convinced that Lucien's visit was due to a double feeling of curiosity, the larger half of which sentiment emanated from the Rue de la Chaussée d'Antin. In short, Madame Donglard, not being able personally to examine in detail the domestic economy and household arrangements, of a man who gave away horses worth thirty thousand francs, and who went to the opera with a Greek slave wearing diamonds to the amount of a million of money, had deputed these eyes by which she was accustomed to see, to give her a faithful account of the mode of life of this incomprehensible person. But the Count did not appear to suspect that there would be the slightest connection between Lucien's visit and the curiosity of the Baroness. "'You are in constant communication with the Baron d'Anglars?' the Count inquired of Albert de Morcerf. "'Yes, Count, you know what I told you. All remains the same, then, in that quarter.' "'It is more than ever a settled thing,' said Lucien. And considering that this remark was all that he was at the time called upon to make, he adjusted the glass to his eye, and biting the top of his gold-headed cane, began to make the tour of the apartment, examining the arms and the pictures. "'Ah!' said Monte Cristo. "'I did not expect that the affair would be so promptly concluded.' "'Oh, things take their course without our assistance. While we are forgetting them, they are falling into their appointed order, and when again our attention is directed to them, we are surprised at the progress they have made towards the proposed end.' My father and Monsieur Donglar served together in Spain, my father in the army, and Monsieur Donglar in the commissariat department. It was there that my father, ruined by the revolution, and Monsieur Donglar, who never had possessed any patrimony, both laid the foundations of their different fortunes. Yes, said Monte Cristo, I think Monsieur Donglar mentioned that in a visit which I paid him, and, continued he, casting a side glance at Lucien, who was turning over the leaves of an album. Mademoiselle Eugenie is pretty, I think. I remember that to be her name. Very pretty, or rather, very beautiful, replied Albert. But of that style of beauty which I do not appreciate, I am an ungrateful fellow. You speak as if you were already her husband." Ah, returned Albert in his turn, looking around to see what Lucien was doing. Really, said Monte Cristo, lowering his voice, you do not appear to me to be very enthusiastic on the subject of this marriage. Mademoiselle Donglars is too rich for me, replied Morcerf, and that frightens me. Bah, exclaimed Monte Cristo, that's a fine reason to give. And you not rich yourself? My father's income is about fifty thousand francs per annum, and he will give me perhaps 
ten or twelve thousand when I marry. That perhaps might not be considered a large sum, in Paris especially, said the Count. But everything does not depend on wealth. And it is a fine thing to have a good name, and to occupy a high station in society. Your name is celebrated, your position magnificent, and then the Comte de Morcerf is a soldier, and it is pleasing to see the integrity of a Bayard united to the poverty of a Dugosclin. Disinterestedness is the brightest ray in which a noble sword can shine. As for me, I consider the union with Mademoiselle Donglar a most suitable one. She will enrich you, and you will ennoble her. Albert shook his head, and looked thoughtful. "'There is still something else,' said he. "'I confess,' observed Monte Cristo, "'that I have some difficulty in comprehending your objection "'to a young lady who is both rich and beautiful.' "'Oh,' said Morcerf, "'this repugnance, if repugnance it may be called, "'is not all on my side. "'Whence can it arise, then? "'For you told me your father desired the marriage.' it is my mother who dissents she has a clear and penetrating judgment and does not smile on the proposed union i cannot account for it but she seems to entertain some prejudice against the donglar ah said the count in a somewhat forced tone that may be easily explained the comtesse de morcerf who is aristocracy and refinement itself does not relish the idea of being allied by your marriage with one of ignoble birth. That is natural enough. I do not know if that is her reason, said Albert. But one thing I do know, that if this marriage be consummated, it will render her quite miserable. There was to have been a meeting six weeks ago in order to talk over and settle the affair. But I had such a sudden attack of indisposition. Real? interrupted the Count, smiling. Oh, real enough, from anxiety, doubtless. At any rate, they postpone the matter for two months. There is no hurry, you know. I am not yet twenty-one, and Eugenie is only seventeen. But the two months expire next week. It must be done. My dear Count, you cannot imagine how my mind is harassed, how happy you are in being exempt from all this. Well, and why should you not be free too? "'What prevents you from being so?' "'Oh, it will be too great a disappointment to my father "'if I do not marry Mademoiselle Donglar. "'Marry her, then,' said the Count, "'with a significant shrug of the shoulders. "'Yes,' replied Morcerf, "'but that will plunge my mother into positive grief.' "'Then do not marry her,' said the Count. "'Well, I shall see.' I will try and think over what is the best thing to be done. You will give me your advice, will you not? And, if possible, extricate me from my unpleasant position. I think, rather than give pain to my dear mother, I would run the risk of offending the Count. Monte Cristo turned away. He seemed moved by this last remark. Ah, said he to Debray, who had thrown himself into an easy chair at the farthest extremity of the salon and who held a pencil in his right hand, and an account-book in his left. "'What are you doing there? Are you making a sketch after Poussin?' "'Oh, no,' was the tranquil response. "'I am too fond of art to attempt anything of that sort. I am doing a little sum in arithmetic.' "'In arithmetic?' "'Yes, I am calculating. By the way, Morcerf, that indirectly concerns you. I am calculating.' what the house of Donglar must have gained by the last rise in Haiti bonds. From 206 they have risen to 409 in three days, and the prudent banker had purchased at 206. Therefore he must have made 300,000 livres. "'That is not his biggest scoop,' said Morcerf. "'Did he not make a million in Spaniards this last year?' "'My dear fellow,' said Lucien, here is the Count of Monte Cristo, who will say to you as the Italians do, Danaro e Santita, meta della meta. 
money and sanctity, each in a moiety. When they tell me such things, I only shrug my shoulders and say nothing. But you were speaking of Haitians, said Monte Cristo. Ah, Haitians, that is quite another thing. Haitians are the account of French stock jobbing. We may like bouillot, delight in whist, be enraptured with Boston, and yet grow tired of them all. But we always come back to a cart. It is not only a game, it is our hors d'oeuvre. Monsieur Danglars sold yesterday at four or five, and pockets three hundred thousand francs. Had he but waited to today, the price would have fallen to two hundred and five, and instead of gaining three hundred thousand francs, he would have lost twenty or twenty-five thousand. "'And what has caused the sudden fall from 409 to 206?' asked Monte Cristo. "'I am profoundly ignorant of all these stock-jobbing intrigues.' "'Because,' said Albert, laughing, <laughs> "'one piece of news follows another, and there is often great dissimilarity between them.' "'Ah,' said the Count, "'I see that Monsieur Danglars is accustomed to play at gaining or losing three hundred thousand francs in a day. "'He must be enormously rich.' "'It is not he who plays,' exclaimed Lucien. "'It is Madame Danglars. She is indeed daring.' "'But you who are a reasonable being, Lucien, "'and who knows how little dependence is to be placed on the news, "'since you are at the fountainhead, "'Surely you ought to prevent it,' said Morcerf, with a smile. "'How can I, if her husband fails in controlling her?' asked Lucien. "'You know the character of the baroness. "'No one has any influence with her, and she does precisely what she pleases.' "'Ah, if I were in your place,' said Albert. "'Well?' "'I would reform her. "'It would be rendering a service to her future son-in-law.' "'How would you set about it?' "'Ah, that would be easy enough. "'I would give her a lesson.' "'A lesson?' "'Yes. "'Your position as secretary to the minister "'renders your authority great on the subject of political news. "'You never open your mouth, "'but the stockbrokers immediately stenograph your words. "'Cause her to lose a hundred thousand francs, "'and that would teach her prudence.' "'I do not understand,' stammered Lucien. "'It is very clear notwithstanding,' replied the young man, with an artlessness, wholly free from affectation. "'Tell her some fine morning, an unheard-of piece of intelligence, some telegraphic dispatch, of which you alone are in possession. For instance, that Henri IV was seen yesterday at Gabriel's. That would boom the market.' She will buy heavily, and she will certainly lose, when Beauchamp announces the following day in his Gazette the report circulated by some usually well-informed persons that the king was seen yesterday at Gabriel's house is totally without foundation. We can positively assert that his majesty did not quit the Pont Neuf. Lucien half smiled. Monte Cristo, although apparently indifferent, had not lost one word of this conversation, and his penetrating eye had even read a hidden secret in the embarrassed manner of the secretary. This embarrassment had completely escaped Albert, but it caused Lucien to shorten his visit. He was evidently ill at ease. The Count, in taking leave of him, said something in a low voice to which he answered, "'Willingly, Count, I accept.' The Count returned to young Morcerf. "'Do you not think on reflection,' said he to him, "'that you have done wrong in thus speaking of your mother-in-law "'in the presence of Monsieur Debray?' "'My dear Count,' said Morcerf, "'I beg of you not to apply that title so prematurely. "'Now speaking without any exaggeration, "'is your mother really so very much averse to this marriage? "'So much so that the baroness very rarely comes to the house.' "'And my mother has not, I think, visited Madame Danglars twice in her whole life.' "'Then,' said the Count, "'I am emboldened to speak openly to you. 
Monsieur Donglard is my banker. Monsieur de Villefort has overwhelmed me with politeness in return for a service which a casual piece of good fortune enabled me to render him. I predict from all this an avalanche of dinners and routs. Now, in order not to presume on this, and also to be beforehand with them, I have, if agreeable to you, thought of inviting Monsieur and Madame Donglard, and Monsieur and Madame de Villefort, to my country house at Auteuil. If I were to invite you and the Count and Countess of Morcerf to this dinner, I should give it the appearance of being a matrimonial meeting, or at least Madame de Morcerf would look upon the affair in that light, especially if Baron Donglard did me the honour to bring his daughter. In that case, your mother would hold me in aversion, and I do not at all wish that. On the contrary, I desire to stand high in her esteem. Indeed, Count, said Morcerf, I thank you sincerely for having used so much candour towards me, and I gratefully accept the exclusion which you propose. You say you desire my mother's good opinion. I assure you it is already yours to a very unusual extent. Do you think so? said Monte Cristo with interest. Oh, I am sure of it. We talked of you an hour after you left us the other day. But to return to what we were saying, if my mother could know of this attention on your part, and I will venture to tell her, I am sure that she will be most grateful to you. It is true that my father will be equally angry. The Count laughed. Well, <laughs> said he to Morcerf, but I think your father will not be the only angry one. Monsieur and Madame Donglard will think me a very ill-mannered person. They know that I am intimate with you, that you are, in fact, one of the oldest of my Parisian acquaintances, and they will not find you at my house. They will certainly ask me why I did not invite you. Be sure to provide yourself with some previous engagement which shall have a semblance of probability, and communicate the fact to me by a line in writing. You know that with bankers nothing but a written document will be valid. I will do better than that, said Albert. My mother is wishing to go to the seaside. What day is fixed for your dinner? Saturday. This is Tuesday. Well, tomorrow evening we leave and the day after we shall be at Treport. Really, Count, you have a delightful way of setting people at their ease. Indeed, you give me more credit than I deserve. I only wish to do what will be agreeable to you. That is all. When shall we send your invitations? This very day. Well, I will immediately call on Monsieur Donglard, and tell him that my mother and myself must leave Paris to-morrow. I have not seen you. Consequently, I know nothing of your dinner. How foolish you are! Have you forgotten that Monsieur de Bray has just been at my house? Ah, true. Fix it this way. I have seen you and invited you without any ceremony. When you instantly answer, that it would be impossible for you to accept, as you were going to Trepor. Well, then, that is settled. But you will come and call on my mother before tomorrow? Before tomorrow? That will be a difficult matter to arrange. Besides, I shall just be in the way of all the preparations for departure. Well, you can do better. You were only a charming man before, but if you accede to my proposal, you will be adorable. What must I do to attain such sublimity? You are today as free as air. Come and dine with me. We shall be a small party, only yourself, my mother, and I. You have scarcely seen my mother. You shall have an opportunity of observing her more closely. She is a remarkable woman, and I only regret that there does not exist another like her, about twenty years younger. In that case, I assure you, 
there would very soon be a countess and viscountess of Morcerf. As to my father, you will not see him. He is officially engaged, and dines with the chief referendary. We will talk over our travels, and you, who have seen the whole world, will relate your adventures. You should tell us the history of the beautiful Greek who was with you the other night at the opera, and whom you call your slave, and yet treat like a princess. We will talk Italian and Spanish. Come, accept my invitation, and my mother will thank you. A thousand thanks, said the Count. Your invitation is most gracious, and I regret exceedingly that it is not in my power to accept it. I am not so much at liberty as you suppose. On the contrary, I have a most important engagement. Ah, uh, take care. You were teaching me just now how in case of an invitation to dinner one might creditably make an excuse. I require the proof of a pre-engagement. I am not a banker like Monsieur Donglard, but I am quite as incredulous as he is. I am going to give you a proof replied the Count, and he rang the bell. "'Huh,' said Morcerf, "'this is the second time you have refused to dine with my mother. It is evident that you wish to avoid her.' Monte Cristo started. "'Oh, you do not mean that,' said he. "'Besides, here comes the confirmation of my assertion.' Baptistin entered, and remaining standing at the door. "'I had no previous knowledge of your visit, had I?' "'Indeed. You are such an extraordinary person that I would not answer for it. "'At all events, I could not guess that you would invite me to dinner.' "'Probably not. "'Well, listen, Baptistine, what did I tell you this morning when I called you into my laboratory?' "'To close the door against visitors as soon as the clock struck five, replied the valet. "'What then?' "'Ah, my dear Count,' said Albert, "'no, no, I wish to do away with that mysterious reputation "'that you have given me, my dear Viscount. "'It is tiresome to be always acting Manfred. "'I wish my life to be free and open. "'Go on, Baptistine. "'Then to admit no one except Major Bartolomeo Cavalcanti and his son. "'You hear? Major Bartolomeo Cavalcanti.' a man who ranks amongst the most ancient nobility of Italy, whose name Dante has celebrated in the tenth canto of the Inferno. You remember it, do you not? Then there is his son, Andrea, a charming young man about your own age, Viscount, bearing the same title as yourself, and who is making his entry into the Parisian world, aided by his father's millions. The Major will bring his son with him this evening, the Contino, as we say in Italy, he confides him to my care. If he proves himself worthy of it, I will do what I can to advance his interests. You will assist me in the work, will you not? Most undoubtedly. This Major Cavalcanti is an old friend of yours, then? By no means. He is a perfect nobleman, very polite, modest, and agreeable, such as may be found constantly in Italy, descendants of very ancient families. I have met him several times at Florence, Bologna, and Lucca, and he has now communicated to me the fact of his arrival in Paris. The acquaintances one makes in travelling have a sort of claim on one. They everywhere expect to receive the same attention which you once paid them by chance." as though the civilities of a passing hour were likely to awaken any lasting interest in favour of the man in whose society you may happen to be thrown in the course of your journey. This good Major Cavalcanti is come to take a second view of Paris, which he only saw in passing through in the time of the Empire, when he was on his way to Moscow. I shall give him a good dinner, he will confide his son to my care. I will promise to watch over him. I shall let him follow in whatever path his folly may lead him. And then I shall have done my part. Certainly I see you are a model mentor, 
said Albert. "'Good-bye. We shall return on Sunday, by the way. I have received news of France.' "'Have you? Is he still amusing himself in Italy?' "'I believe so. However, he regrets your absence extremely. He says you were the son of Rome, and that without you all appears dark and cloudy. I do not know if he does not even go so far as to say that it rains.' "'His opinion of me is altered for the better, then?' "'No. He still persists in looking upon you as the most incomprehensible and mysterious of beings.' "'He is a charming young man,' said Monte Cristo, "'and I felt a lively interest in him the very first evening of my introduction, when I met him in the search of a supper, and prevailed upon him to accept a portion of mine. He is, I think, the son of General d'Epinay. He is. The same who was so shamefully assassinated in 1815. By the Bonapartists. Yes, really, I like him extremely. Is there not also a matrimonial engagement contemplated for him? Yes, sir, he is to marry Mademoiselle de Villefort. Indeed. "'And you know I am to marry Mademoiselle Donglard, said Albert, laughing. "'You smile?' "'Yes. Why do you do so?' "'I smile because there appears to me about as much inclination for the consummation of the engagement in question as there is for my own. But really, my dear Count, we are talking as much of women as they do of us.' "'It is unpardonable.' Albert rose. "'Are you going?' "'Really, that is a good idea. Two hours have I been boring you to death with my company, and then you, with the greatest politeness, ask me if I am going. "'Indeed, Count, you are the most polished man in the world. And your servants, too. How very well behaved they are. There is quite a style about them.' Monsieur Baptistin, especially, I could never get such a man as that. My servants seem to imitate those you sometimes see in a play, who, because they have only a word or two to say, acquit themselves in the most awkward manner possible. Therefore, if you part with Monsieur Baptistin, give me the refusal of him. By all means. That is not all. Give my compliments— to your illustrious Lucanese, Cavalcante of the Cavalcanti, and if by any chance you should be wishing to establish his son, find him a wife very rich, very noble on her mother's side at least, and a baroness in a right of her father, I will help you in the search. Ah, you will do as much as that, will you? Yes. Well, really nothing is certain in this world. "'Oh, Count, what a service you might render me! "'I should like you a hundred times better "'if by intervention I could manage to remain a bachelor, "'even were it only for ten years.' "'Nothing is impossible,' gravely replied Monte Cristo. "'And taking leave of Albert, he returned into the house "'and struck the gong three times. "'Bertuccio appeared.' "'Monsieur Bertuccio, you understand that I intend entertaining company on Saturday at Doy. Bertuccio slightly started. "'I shall require your services to see that all be properly arranged. "'It is a beautiful house, or, at all events, may be made so. "'There must be a good deal done before it can deserve that title, Your Excellency, "'for the tapestry hangings are very old.' let them all be taken away and changed then with the exception of the sleeping chamber which is hung with red damask you will leave that exactly as it is bertuccio bowed you will not touch the garden either as to the yard you may do what you please with it i should prefer that being altered beyond all recognition i will do everything in my power to carry out your wishes your excellency I should be glad, however, to receive Your Excellency's commands concerning the dinner. 
"'Really, my dear Monsieur Bertuccio," said the Count, "'since you have been in Paris, you have become quite nervous, and apparently out of your element. You no longer seem to understand me. But surely your Excellency will be so good as to inform me whom you are expecting to receive. I do not yet know myself. Neither it is necessary that you should do so. Lucullus dines with Lucullus. That is quite sufficient. Bertuccio bowed and left the room. End of chapter 54 All right, then. Going back to the beginning of the chapter, I thought it was really interesting that Albert said the person who is most against his match to Danglar's daughter, the one who seems to not like men quite so much just in general, is his mom. Mom is interesting. Mom, it will continue to be interesting. And it puts into question, what's her impulse? Is it that she realizes that Eugenie doesn't have any interest in her son? Is it that she can foresee that there is not going to be a happy marriage in that quarter? Or is it that she doesn't want her son to have anything to do with Danglar's family? Any one of those is probably a valid interpretation. I'm sure there are several others as well. But that's an interesting one to watch. The other thing that's interesting is that it's Lucien de Bray who came with Albert to visit the Count so that he could kind of get the lay of the land for Madame Danglar, since he is her special friend. He's also, as you might recall, the financial guy, one of the financial guys in the government, which is why I thought it was so interesting that the Count said, are you drawing like that guy, Poussin, who pays attention to line? Because this is a guy who's going to be counting a lot, but also somebody who understands twists and turns and machinations in a way that perhaps other people who aren't part of that world wouldn't. I forgot to mention stock jobbing at the beginning. As far as I can tell, that's just buying and selling stocks. It's treating it like a job. It's you're working the stock market or the the market that was then at the time. Didn't you also think that this chapter was really interesting as far as Albert goes, just in general? I thought he he seemed far more mature in this chapter than we've seen prior to this. I thought I thought that was pretty interesting. And it made me happy. And it, it makes me happy, I think, every time Albert says something that stops the count and makes him kind of do one of his silent and not well seen double takes. It's very curious and I think kind of brilliant the way Duma keeps feeding us little moments like that. And it's interesting too because this chapter, the title has been translated several different ways. One is a flurry of stocks, and the other option is rise and fall. I think that last one is interesting because who's rising and who's falling? Did we see anyone do either in this chapter? Not really. I mean, we saw Albert talking about not really wanting to marry Eugenie. I don't know if that would be considered a fall or not. It's kind of interesting, I guess. Franz gets mentioned at the end. He's still hanging out, not in Paris. And that conversation was an interesting one to track. But the big one is Bartolomeo Cavalcante. This is a completely new name. We have not heard about Cavalcante. He is a character. He does show up in Dante's Inferno in the 10th canto, I think. And he's, it doesn't seem to have any resonance, that, that particular line of text, except that Cavalcante's son was somebody who Dante knew. So as Virgil is taking him around hell, um, he sees the father of his friend and they have kind of a weird conversation and that's it. So Cavalcante is a name that would not be unknown to Dumas' audience. But we can't necessarily see yet why this name should matter to us. But Dumas is clearly dropping the Inferno line for a reason. And there won't be a payoff on that one for a while. And that's fine. A couple of great voicemails for you this week. The first one comes from Amy, who has checked in with us before about having read the abridged version 
of the Count of Monte Cristo when she was in school and many times since then as well. So she has an update for us on the opera chapter. And then Ken from Honolulu called again, and he had a very important insight about the opera chapter as well, something that I completely missed. So here we go with our voicemails from Amy and Ken. Hi, Heather. It's Amy. Amy Crochets on Ravelry, A-I-M-E-E. I I just finished this week, uh, listening to this week's podcast, and yay, another chapter that was completely eliminated from the abridged version that I read for high school and every year thereafter because I loved it so much. Uh, Yeah, if I'm remembering correctly, the opera scene that never happened in my version, in my world, well, Countess G never appeared in the abridged version, but Eugenie did, Eugenie Danglar. She is in there, of course, not in this scene, I don't think, but her role is in the abridged version, and the end adventure that she has is included. I don't want to go into any more details because it would give things away, but that does happen, and we do meet Louise and see a little bit of what's happening there. So, interestingly, yeah, that was kept in. Very, very French. Uh, yeah, definitely not English from that time period. But since you asked for the feedback, I thought I would let you know. I'm, I'm loving this because, yeah, I've not read my abridged version in the last year because I've been listening to this. So I might be getting it mixed up again. But, yeah, I don't recall Heide telling the Count about this at this point either. I think that's left it for later in the story as kind of a bigger reveal. But I could be wrong. Um, Anyway, I'm loving it, of course. I hope you're having a wonderful new year. And good luck with the driving. Our oldest son is going through that right now, too. And it's a fun adventure. Take care. Talk to you later. Bye. Hi. This is Ken from Honolulu. Regarding the last episode where they went to the opera, I can understand why Dumas made the comment that he did about the Count leaving everybody noticing that the Count was leaving, but I was kind of surprised that you didn't catch it. Actually, the Count was not leaving. Heidi wanted to leave, and so the Count had to leave with her. It's not that he had stopped watching the play, but she did not want to be around that man anymore that betrayed her father. It was just uh, kind of a point. I can understand why Dumont did it, because it gives another point that people are noticing him, but it's the point that he wasn't leaving, she was leaving. I really enjoyed the book. I enjoy your information before and afterwards. Thank you. Bye. And before I let you go, first, remember, you can call 206-350-1642 and leave a message. And number two, I wanted to thank people who joined Patreon to support the show in January. And I wanted to thank people who raised their pledge amount. That would be Linda, Nancy, Susan, and Joanne. Thank you all so much for making this show possible. One of the things that this will do is allow me to do the book 1984 as a special sideline to Craftlet. As soon as I can get the logistics worked out, because it's kind of complicated, I will do so, and I'll let you know where you can find that book's podcast, because it's, it's going to be different. It's not going to be on the regular Craftlet feed. I'm going to have to do something completely different with it, just logistically for you, so that it doesn't clutter up the Count of Monte Cristo and the premium feed. So that is that, and have a great week. I'll talk to you next week. Take care. Bye. If you like getting free audiobooks with benefits every week, please consider supporting the show over at patreon.com slash craftlet. There are rewards waiting for you beyond, you know, the free podcast. You can also subscribe to our premium streaming audio by tapping the red lock when you are looking at the app or at the show notes at craftlet.libsyn.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for a premium download subscription by following the links in the right-hand sidebar at craftlit.com. And if it's easier for you, you can always subscribe and review at iTunes and at Stitcher Radio. Like us on Facebook, support us at Patreon, and come with us on tour. For nine years, Craftlit has been kept going by the support of you, 
the listener. And for that, I am truly grateful. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on 